Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to talk about how I made this high level mortar set for Atlas Empires. I'll talk a bit about hand painting and modelling of mobile game assets uh, with lots of tips and tricks along the way. This is all part of a bigger playlist so do check out if you're interested in the work that I'm doing for them. All the links to different playlists are in the description along with other playlists and useful stuff like the courses that I offer and things like that. Also if you're interested in learning Blender check out the playlists on my channel. There's lots of free courses there. Anyway, let's talk about the model. This took about, I don't know, three days, something like that, um, on and off working on it uh, with other different projects. But it does take a while to get these models completed. The hand painting process is the longest process, but it's certainly a lot of fun doing it. It's really exciting that the game will be released hopefully next month, at the beginning of next month, and I'm already starting to see some of my models in the game, and there's nothing more exciting as a game artist than seeing your models finally in the game uh, doing their jobs. <laughs> okay, so the important thing here is to uh, model around the center of this object. It's the same for most of these things. You've got a sort of grid in a sense that you're working from and working from around the center, especially with cylindrical objects like this and having a center point in the middle so you can rotate objects around it. Uh, that's all important. And the mirroring, uh, so mirroring by the Y and the X and sometimes the Z as well, but rarely. Uh, gives you sort of uh, less painting space to work on uh, and therefore you only have to paint half of it. It does limit uh, what you can paint so you have to be careful when you're doing shading and things like that that the shadows don't come across on the other side. If they're linked to another object uh, it can be a little bit awkward that. Generally where possible you're trying to delete inside faces but it's not too bad to have some overlapping faces. A lot of the time uh, I get asked questions about, oh, you've got lots of overlapping geometry and things like that. That's okay. Uh, don't go overboard. Don't waste space because obviously anything that's inside your shape you're not going to see. Therefore, you don't really uh, want it to be there in terms of on your texture atlas and your, um, your UVs uh, because you're wasting painting space. So when it comes to the texture maps, originally they asked me to put them all onto 512 by 512 maps. So the whole set and everything that's painted was on that detail resolution. So it was very tricky. Um, since then they've um, said that they're not seeing any performance issues so uh, we can go a bit bigger with the maps. Um, so I'm quite glad about that because it just gives me a little bit more breathing space. Um, I don't have to be so uh, precise and mirror so many objects so I can add a little bit of shading in there where I need to. A lot of the time I'm using link duplicates so I'm repeating uh, these shapes over and over again. That's good in two ways. Uh, one, you obviously only have to model it once and you can edit that original and it will update on all your subsequent models. And uh, obviously the um, models are getting more detailed as they go through so they're sharing a lot of things from the previous uh, model or previous iteration. But the other important thing to that is the texture space. So if that's only using one small segment of UVs, let's say these spikes around the middle there, I've only got one small area of UVs and all the spikes will go into that and they'll share uh, that UV map. So if you're confused about UV mapping at all, then look at my playlist for um, UV wrapping, unwrapping for beginners and that will explain what's going on here. But it's a really important process, uh, very important to games, especially that um, objects need to share UV space a lot of the time so you don't have loads of texture maps because that's really intensive for graphics cards and um, especially in mobile games. So they call that texture calls and each time the graphics card or your processor has to look for a texture that's called a texture call and if you've got loads and loads of textures uh, then that can be a problem so it's actually better to have one big texture uh, rather than smaller textures. That's how I understand it anyway. I'm not an expert when it comes to games and texturing. I'm only an expert when it comes, if you can call me an expert, when it comes to the art side of things, so the drawing and the painting and so on. So um, I work with the game developers and uh, understand the limitations and constraints that artists have, uh, but I don't fully understand how <laughs> they're integrated into the games. So you can see for all these bases that I'm always trying to use a mirror so that I can limit the texture space. So I only have to paint one corner and it will repeat it round the outside. The only problem then is if you've got a shape that's sort of inserted into that object, uh, then you have to do some shading for that and you can't do that if it's a mirror because it will copy the UVs and the shading will appear on the other side where there's no object. Um, so those are the sort of limitations you have when you're painting for mobile games. 
I see a lot of artists, they're uh, creating wonderful, uh, fantastic artwork, uh, but uh, they're not using these limitations. And it can be much more fun doing it like that because you can create wonderful pieces uh, and you draw in all the shading and highlights and so forth. Uh, but in reality, in mobile games like this, it's far more difficult because uh, you have all those constraints. Um, especially as this is a 3D game on your mobile phone, uh, it has to be really well optimized, of course, so you can imagine the constraints that they have. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be an amazing game. I'm really looking forward to it. They said they are going to give me a copy so I can have a go. Uh, I've been waiting for a while now. Um, I think it's uh, more complicated than it seems because it's obviously available in certain countries and it's in beta and all these sort of things. It's sort of pre-release. Uh, so <laughs> one day I'm going to get a copy of this game and it's going to be amazing. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's kind of fun making crystals. You can see the crystals I'm making here. I take a cube and then just sort of slice it up and merge vertices and things. There's <laughs> something weirdly satisfying about that. They're very hard to paint because obviously uh, anything with reflections is really tricky to paint because when you move around it, the reflections should move. So you're trying to mimic reflections, uh, which doesn't work. If you've ever tried baking reflections, you'll know what I mean. So if you try and uh, bake your uh, glossiness or um, <laughs> your reflection map, it's just, it seems sort of totally pointless really, uh, because as soon as you move it should change and then it looks all fake and uh, unnatural. So I get lots of questions about that, about uh, why, why do my reflections look bad when I bake them and so forth. That's, it's just something you can't actually do and that's why we've got ray tracing cards now and all these sort of things to try and make games look more realistic uh, with realistic uh, reflections. Uh, so painting things like uh, silver, metals, gold and all those sort of things are really, really tough. And there's loads of metal in these sets. So it, it, uh, for the most part, I try and make the metals really rough. But every now and again, and as the levels uh, build as well, we're trying to make them more elaborate and more exciting. So we're adding a bit of gold in there, shinier metals. so They look a bit more glossy and exciting. Uh, so I have to, <laughs> with the paintwork, try and figure that one out. A useful technique I've learned recently is to use the color dodge and the color burn. That seems to just add that element of uh, me metallic uh, look to it. Um, so you've got that metallic slider in the pr principal BSDF. And basically what that does is uh, in the highlights, it makes them uh, colorful, uh, whereas highlights of plastic uh, tend to go towards white, um, sort of desaturated. But um, the metals kind of retains its color, hence why the color dodge and the, the color burn, uh, they do that sort of thing, uh, rather than the screen and the multiply, which uh, screen and multiply are the light and dark brushes that I often use. Uh, so I'm using a bit more of the color dodge and color burn. They're different types of uh, light and dark brushes. Now when I started this section you probably noticed that I imported one of the models in. That's two reasons for that is that I can get a sense of the colors from the previous um, iterations of this model. Because we're starting at level six here so these are sort of new models. Uh, the players in the game felt like they couldn't tell when their um, level of mortar was getting bigger and better and so forth so we needed some more models to go in there. Uh, hence why I'm um, uh, doing these sort of last minute adjustments in a sense to before the release uh, so that the players can um, have extra models and uh, sort of that sense of improvement as you're playing. So I've obviously brought one of the old models in to make sure that I'm matching colors up but it's also really useful to um, use that section, that middle section uh, on this map. I actually um, baked the texture so it's not particularly efficient that because it's on two texture maps but it gets very confusing uh, when you've got a new set of models and you're trying to texture it's a very small space um, but you'll notice or well no one will notice but it is actually on uh, two different texture maps this Canon model so it's a, a little bit of um, naughtiness in terms of the optimization of the game so you can see me using that color dodge brush here around the edges and just adding that sort of glare um, off or sheen off the side of the metal. The other thing to note about painting metal, and you can see me do it with most of the, um, the objects when I start, I start just painting with random colors but on a really really low strength, just as if the metal is reflecting different colors of the environment around. That gives it a bit of life. If you just start with a block color, let's say blue in this case, 
um, and just uh, fill it in and then start doing your highlights and so forth. It really doesn't give it a sense that it's metal because there's no reflections coming from the different objects. Occasionally I'll try and use an object that's close to it but again uh, I can't use that all the time because the objects are getting repeated and there may be say gold next to them and then a red metal next to them uh, in the next model. So because these shapes are being repeated all the time uh, that gets a bit frustrating so I can't um, realistically reflect the other areas of the model. Um, so I just have to sort of mimic it uh, by doing random colors around the shape. What I was noticing, the earlier models that I made, they're very rough metals and that's uh, on purpose in a sense because of those reflections, but trying to do these sort of shinier reflections made them a bit more contrasty. So trying to match them up, I was constantly using the fill brush on a saturation level to try and desaturate uh, the colors so they matched in with the earlier versions. Because that color dodge brush and the color burn, they, they can push to a, a color and it makes it very sort of saturated looking. Uh, it's, it's obviously down to the way you paint it as well and what colors you're picking, uh, but it's much easier to go in that direction. Now I've left out the sort of unwrapping process because that's a little bit dull and uh, most of the time now I'm automating it just for speed because they need these models really quickly and I've noticed it didn't make too much difference if I unwrapped it sort of in a professional way by going in marking all the seams and just doing an automatic un unwrap. I wouldn't normally do that but because it's such a big set and they're scattered all over the place I'm not taking these textures into Photoshop or anything like that it's just not making that much difference. Now when modeling this much material and trying to keep a pace up so I can uh, get them out there uh, quickly to uh, get into the game and so forth. So there's a tight deadline here and I'm modeling quite fast. There's obviously going to be some mistakes and occasionally I catch myself out with a mistake that's really difficult to rectify once you've already started painting on your UV map. So obviously moving the UVs around is a real pain. So if I've forgotten to unwrap a certain section or let's say um, I shouldn't have added a mirror somewhere or something along those lines. So there's some area that's not been unwrapped properly. I need to go in and unwrap again. And therefore I've got to try and find space in my UV map for those um, new objects. A particular example would be when I'm using the solidify modifier and I forget to apply that before unwrapping. So when I'm painting, it sort of spreads across the solidify modifier because it's only unwrapped that uh, one face and the whole sort of inside uh, isn't being unwrapped uh, properly. And there is a lot of problem solving that you have to do like that as an artist. So it is good to have sort of good technical knowledge as well as artistic ability. I do, for the most part, suggest that people concentrate on their artistic skills and technical knowledge. But in this case, and for problem solving, it is really important to have a good understanding of um, how things work so you can fix problems if they arise. You should be able to see now that there's more sort of shiny metals being produced on these sort of later models uh, rather than the earlier ones. So I'm going to turn a bit more on the glossiness. And again, you can see that sort of color dodge. And I'm actually picking a different color um, so it's sort of the blues merge across the reds uh, and the color dodge has a red so it sort of gives it an um, unusual tint to the highlight uh, and just makes it sort of pop from um, the original. It's good fun doing that, especially with the gold. I like to make, um, obviously gold everybody thinks uh, yellow, but there's quite a lot of orange in there as well and there's obviously the reflections from the other objects so I like to push the color dodge across the orange and then sort of uh, build in that sort of reflective quality, that real sort of character that gold has rather than just very flat uh, screen brush uh, with the highlights. And you can hit, see here for this sort of strange red material, this red uh, metal that's sort of got a uh, glow to it in different areas and that's the shine and the sheen. And you can sort of paint that in. It doesn't work when you're moving around the object uh, because the sheen should move, but it gives it that illusion when it's sort of fairly static and that's quite nice. So you can see here I'm fixing some errors with this uh, mortar bomb uh, and uh, I've obviously done something uh, where I mirrored it and it didn't quite work and I was getting some anomalies when I was painting so I'm having to reposition that uh, object and then I got this strange crash where everything went black and I started worrying but it was all alright in the end. <laughs> And I came back in, just reloaded. Uh, 2.9, a tiny bit glitchy still. So I'm back in 2.83 here. 
So you saw me there having to sort of reposition the UVs and find a space for them. The good thing is with the automatic unwrap, as long as you're not using something like uh, the texture packer add-ons and things where it packs them in really tight, you've got a little bit of leeway with your UVs to find areas and find spaces. So if it's unwrapped a circle, for, a, for instance, you'll find a space inside that circle usually. Uh, so there is a bit of wasted space, to be honest, but it, it saves me a lot of the time, especially uh, with such a fast sort of workflow and loads of different models. There's going to be mistakes around the place, uh, so you have to watch out for that. And here I was making a funny mistake as well. I'd changed my brush to dots and I'd forgotten, and you could see me trying to figure out repeating it why on earth is my brush coming out so weirdly and strangely <laughs> it's just the brush settings so i'd uh, use error as as is commonly the case do enjoy painting the gold there's something about gold that's uh, really sort of interesting uh, and i like that sort of highlights and uh, using that color dodge brush and really trying to get that glow working you've got to be careful not to go overboard because again you don't want to distract from the other elements uh, within the scene of your game and so forth and the great thing is that Chris Handlauser, the lead artist, is adding some effects to all these. So it makes them look really exciting in the end with all these different effects in Unity. Uh, and that's where the real magic happens when it's got a tiny bit of animation to it as well. Here I'm doing the crystal. I do find crystals really tough. It's very hard to sort of mimic that uh, glow and uh, reflections that you get from uh, real crystals. And it's kind of impossible in a sense because... Uh, reflections obviously like I've been saying uh, they move around and they change uh, when you move your object so uh, that's kind of as close as you can get in a sense uh, to the, um, the f a finished crystal in sort of 2D space as it were. And here's sort of like the lava molten rock bomb uh, with a glow again using those sort of color dodge screens and sort of going over it so it sort of looks like it's glowing out from the middle. It is nice when you're painting these models and you've got link duplicates to see you paint one model and then it repeats itself across your shape and suddenly you're finished and you think, oh wow, I'm actually there and it's much quicker than I thought it was going to be even though <laughs> it has taken you days to get to this point. So just filling in the last bits there and there we have it, the final result. Uh, so quite pleased with these obviously and uh, they'll be going into the game with lots of different effects and uh, really excited to uh, use these models in the game uh, eventually. Do let me know if you're enjoying this series and whether you'd like to see more. I've got a couple more sets that I've done and I'm thinking of doing commentary over the top of those. If you have any questions as well, I could answer the questions whilst going through the commentary and showing you the different steps that I'm taking. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.